All right, welcome to our second piece, uh, part two of our learning unit. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is operant conditioning. So in our first video, we talked um, about mostly classical conditioning, um, although we mentioned that there's kind of three basic ways that we learn. Uh, so we've got classical conditioning, we have operant conditioning, and then later we'll talk about cognition. So this is kind of a second piece. So what is operant conditioning in general? Operant conditioning is a learning process by which behaviors are reinforced or punished, thus strengthening or extinguishing a response. So the big difference here is what we're going to be doing now is we're going to start associating either positive outcomes or negative outcomes with certain behaviors. So we start to kind of see, again, a, a consequence is kind of a nice way to think of it. When I do something, what is the consequence of doing that thing? When there's a positive consequence, I'm going to be more likely to do it again. When there's negative consequence, I'm going to be less likely to do it again. So notice that we're still making um, connections, right? We're still looking at association, just like with classical conditioning. Uh, where classical conditioning, we're associating two different things that when something happens, it means something else is going to happen right after. Here, it's about our behavior. So instead of associating it with a specific you know, object or event, we're associating our behavior with a consequence that's going to happen later on. Okay, so we're still looking at associations, just a little bit different type. So to start off here, we want to talk about early operant conditioning. So Edward Thorndike is basically the first researcher to really start looking at, or um, I guess kind of discover operant conditioning. And the way he did that was by using what is called uh, the puzzle box, Edward Thorndike's puzzle box. Um, you have an image of it right here, we'll kind of talk about it. So basically what they did is they had a puzzle box that they would place a hungry cat in. So this is a hungry cat in that box. Um, and the box, although it could look a little bit different, basically the main parts was that somewhere in that box was a lever on the floor. Um, and that lever basically controlled the opening of the box. So if the cat pushed the lever, the box would open up and the cat would be able to get out. Um, and then they would place food outside the box. So you've got a hungry cat in the box. If they push the lever, it opens up the door, they can get out and they eat. The idea is, is again, once they get out, they get a reward. The food is the reward. Um, now, the way that the, the cat is going to get out is through trial and error. We'll talk about trial and error um, a little bit more. Again, we talk a little bit more about like cognition and how we solve problems. Um, but basically, it's just by attempting various things and eventually you find a way that works, right? The, the cat isn't necessarily like problem solving the way a human would, um, but they're just going to kind of you know, mess around and maybe they accidentally hit the lever or they're going to just kind of investigate things and eventually they're going to find their way out. So that's the basics of the puzzle box. Now this leads uh, Thorndike to create what is called Thorndike's law of effect or the law of effect. Um, and I'm just going to read it for you and then we'll kind of look at this example. So the law of effect is that responses immediately followed by favorable consequences will be more likely to occur in the future. Behaviors followed by unfavorable consequences will become less likely to occur in the future. So in this graph, you see um, just basically a graph of these cats trying to escape this puzzle box. Um, and what you'll kind of notice, although there's a lot of up and down, what you'll basically notice is that every trial, they tend to get a little bit better. So over time, they're getting better and better. They're getting faster and faster at getting out of the box. And what's really happening here is this law of effect, where basically every time that the cat hits that lever and immediately is rewarded with food, what's going to happen is the next time they're in that box, they're going to be more likely to hit that lever quicker. Now, it's not perfect. Um, again, we're, we're still talking about cats, so these aren't necessarily humans that are remembering exactly what to do to get out of the box. But they're getting better and better at it. They start to learn that if I hit the lever, that means there's going to be a positive reward at the end. Now, we can do this exact same thing with negative consequences. Um, and we'll see that a little bit more a little bit later. Um, but it's basically the same thing just switched. So when I do something and something bad happens to me, I'm less likely to do it again. So we basically see the same thing. It's all about uh, rewards and punishment and increasing or decreasing certain behaviors. So that's going to lead us to uh, B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner is the, the founder of the modern behavioral perspective. He is very, very, very important. Um, again, the behavioral wave of psychology is incredibly influential um, and kind of what brought psychology into the more um, kind of like general public, 
uh, where before it wasn't necessarily something that a lot of people cared about or learned about, and then it became more, more common for that to be something that regular people would talk about or hear about or read about in a magazine or whatever. So Skinner creates um, what is called the operant chamber or Skinner box. You can use either term. Um, they mean the same thing. So again, operant chamber, you can think about operant conditioning, the operant chamber, or the Skinner box, named after him, obviously. And what he did there was he researched operant conditioning, which we've talked about a little bit already, and schedules of reinforcement. Now, we're going to talk about schedules of reinforcement a little bit later, but he's doing both of those at the same time. He's researching both of those through kind of changing things. Now, uh, this is an example, if you look on the right there, of the operant uh, chamber or the Skinner box. There's a whole bunch of pieces. Now, it doesn't have to look exactly like this, but this is maybe like all the stuff that could be there. So sometimes some of these might be missing or something might be added, but it's basically look like this. So we've got a box. Um, within there, we usually have a mouse or a rat. And then there's a whole bunch of things. The really important ones, the most important parts, are this lever here and this pellet dispenser. Now, at a really basic level, what's going to happen is when the mouse pushes the lever, it's going to dispense a pellet. Now, we're going to change this, and there's a lot of different ways that we can do it, which is how we're going to look at schedules of reinforcement. But the main idea is push the lever, get a pellet. In addition, we can sometimes have different signal lights, like red or green. We can have a speaker that makes a sound. Sometimes they'll have an electrical grid, uh, grid that will apply a mild electric shock. And we can do all these different things. The main thing is, is the mouse is going to push the lever, and then something else is going to happen. Okay, that's the main idea. Um, I'm just going to read this bottom piece for you. Sorry, I just covered it up. Uh, it says, in these boxes, he would present his subjects with positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, or aversive stimuli in various timing intervals or schedules. Now, again, we're going to talk more about what the schedules are uh, closer in a little bit when we get a little bit more towards the end. Um, that were designed to produce or inhibit specific target behaviors. So basically it goes like this. Um, positive reinforcement would obviously be the food. So we can set it up where every time the mouse pushes the lever, they're going to get a piece of food. So what we're going to see is, you know, how often do they push the lever? When do they stop? What's the speed? Um, we could also maybe do an interval. So uh, maybe they push the lever, but they can't get any more food for a minute or something like that. We could also use different things like sounds or lights. So maybe you push the lever when it's green, um, but you don't push it when it's red. If you push it when it's red, maybe you get an electrical shock. Uh, you could also use um, an aversive stimuli. So like I could, you know, maybe put a, a mild electrical current in the floor, but when you push the lever, it stops. Or I can make an annoying noise in the speaker. When you push the lever, it stops. So there's a lot of different things we can do. Again, it's all centering around this mouse pushing this lever and then something happening. So two of the big things that uh, we're going to discover through his research are what are called shaping and chaining. Now, shaping is the main piece. Chaining is kind of a subset. So um, this is kind of a step past uh, what Skinner is really going to start doing at the beginning. Um, this is going to be really, really common, and it's really important for your guys' project where you're we're teaching someone. Uh, this is something you're definitely going to want to use. So shaping is a procedure in which reinforcers gradually guide an animal's actions toward a desired complex behavior. Now, again, we're looking at animals. Obviously, this does apply in a way to humans, not as well because we can talk to each other. So generally speaking, you can, you know, tell someone what to do instead of shaping them at least all the way. But with an animal, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly reinforce them every time you do something. That way, they slowly will move towards a complex behavior. I'm going to give you a really simple example here of, let's say you have a dog and you want to cha uh, train that dog to sit. So, um, you know, you have to get them to come to you. You have to, you know, get them to learn the command sit and then to sit down. Shaping would work where basically we start off, if anybody's trained a dog, you've probably gone through this, where you have to start off and first you have to get the dog's attention and you maybe you reward them for that attention, right? So every time you call their name and they pay attention to you, you know, you give them a treat. And then eventually you say, okay, you say sit. And obviously the first time you do that, they're just going to stare at you because they don't know what that means. So you say sit and then maybe you, you know, someone like pushes their butt down. That way they do the action and then you reward them. And you do that over and over again, right? You say sit and someone like pushes their butt down. You do it again and again and again. Eventually the dog learns, right? When I say sit, they sit. And I'm still giving them the reward. That reinforcer is really important. 
So I'm slowly moving them toward this behavior. Now we could go even further and say, okay, now that they're sitting, maybe I want them to lay down and then I want them to roll over. So first I'm going to do sit. I give them a reward when they sit. Then I slowly teach them, okay, now lay down. So I, you know, go reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. Eventually they lay down, right? Then I say, okay, roll over. Again, I help them. And we're just slowly reinforcing until eventually we get to the point where we can say sit lay down, roll over, and then I give them maybe one treat at the very end, but they can do the whole thing. It's a complex behavior. We've learned it step by step. We're slowly shaping them, rewarding them for little steps, and then eventually it becomes you know, an overall thing. Chaining is very closely connected to it. It's not necessarily separate from shaping. Um, it's kind of a part of it. So chaining is where we're gonna break down a task into very small steps. And then what we're going to do is we're going to teach each step by itself and then add it together. So we can use this exactly like I just did in that example. So when you're teaching your dog to sit, lay down, roll over, you don't do it all at once. You teach them to sit, you teach them to lay down, and then you teach them to roll over. And you teach them all separately. Then at the end, you add that all together and they do the whole thing. This is the same way that we learn. So I always think of it um, in terms of like athletics or maybe even a musical instrument. But let's say like the first time you learned how to um, shoot a basketball, right? They're not just going to say, okay, pick up the ball and shoot it, right? You're going to learn each part. So the first thing is, how do I hold the ball? What's my hand position? Then you're going to learn, okay, then you're going to rise up, right? And um, this is what you're going to use with your hands or how you're going to push or how you're going to aim, right? And you slowly are doing piece, piece by piece by piece. And then eventually you add it all together. That's chaining. So it's all these little pieces that come together to make the entire chain. We'll watch these two videos in class. We're just going to look at examples of how we can use shaping and chaining in animals to get them to do complex tasks that maybe it wasn't seem like they would be able to do. So that's going to get us to reinforcers. So we've talked about these before already, um, but we want to make sure we define them. So reinforcer or reinforcing stimulus, I should say is a consequence or outcome that increases the likelihood of a behavior occurring again. Now, this is really important. This is a very broad definition. Again, a consequence or outcome that increases the likelihood of a behavior occurring again. So anything that's going to increase the likelihood would be considered a reinforcing stimulus. Some of the main examples that we have are things like food, water, hug, payment, praise, those are all kind of the big ones. Food is one of the biggest. That's kind of one of our main reinforcers that we use um, as psychologists or even really as human beings. So let's break these down a little bit more. So we can also break these reinforcing stimuli down into different groups. So the two main groups we can break this down into is a primary reinforcement and secondary reinforcers. So primary reinforcement or primary reinforcers uh, occur naturally and they don't require any learning to work. So they're something that are naturally rewarding to us. They're generally, right, something that has a evolutionary purpose, something that we naturally look for or need for survival. So the main primary reinforcer that we usually use is something like food. That is something that you don't have to teach someone that food is a reward, whether it's a human being or an animal, it just is. We like food. We want food. When we get food, we are happy about it. So it increases our likelihood. So our big kind of examples of primary reinforcers are food, uh, air, sleep, water, sex. Those are all things that are considered rewards. Secondary reinforcers are a little bit different. Secondary reinforcers can also sometimes be called conditioned reinforcement, uh, which actually kind of gives you a hint about what the difference is. So a secondary reinforcer is something that we have learned is a reward. So they've become rewarding by being paired with another reinforcing stimulus. It's a learned association. So the biggest example that I think of for a secondary reinforcer is money. Money itself, like if like a, a dollar bill has no real value, right? You can't eat it. You can't like, it doesn't help you. It doesn't keep you warm. Money doesn't do anything. The only reason money is rewarding for us and that we like it is because I can use money to buy something else. And the reality is whatever I'm buying is the real reward. So when you go to work and you get a job and you get paid, the money itself isn't the reward. 
the reward is that I can buy food or I can buy a house or I can buy a game or whatever it is I want to spend that money on. So that's that secondary reinforcer. It's something we've learned. Uh, a, a simple, another simple way to think about it is like a baby. Um, if you give a baby a secondary reinforcer, it doesn't mean anything to them, right? If you give a baby money, they don't really care. Money doesn't mean anything to them. They would much rather have, you know, a piece of food or a piece of candy than they would like, than they would have a hundred dollars because it doesn't mean anything. But eventually over time, they learn that money means something and then it has value. So that's the difference. Primary are things that are naturally rewarding. Secondary reinforcers are things that we have learned are worth money or worth, I said worth money, worth something, worth a reward. So let's talk about types of reinforcers. Like, and again, there's a lot of kind of different pieces here. So we're talking about reinforcers in general. They can be primary or secondary. This is really about reinforcing and the, the process of reinforcement. So the first one is what is called a positive reinforcement. Now we're going to break this down a little bit because there's basically four pieces. We can have reinforcement, we can have punishment, and then either of those can be positive or negative. And this is where it can, it can get a little tricky. So a positive reinforcement is a pleasant consequence, a reinforcing stimulus, that increases the likelihood of repeating a behavior. Now, what makes it positive is not that it's good. What makes it positive is that we are adding something in. And this is a very, very, very important piece. In this context, in the contents of psychology, positive is referring not to um, good or bad. Positive is referring or um referring to adding. So a positive reinforcement is where we add something good that is going to increase our response. We're adding something that will increase the likelihood we do that thing again. So an example of a positive reinforcement is a piece of candy, a treat for a dog, um, a thumbs up from Chuck Norris. Those are all things that are positive reinforcements. They are adding, they're being given to us. It's um, and it is increasing the likelihood we'll do something again. Now, like I said, we also have the flip side, which is a negative reinforcement. Now, this is again where things can get a little bit tricky. A negative reinforcement is still reinforcing, so it's still increasing the behavior. The difference is, is it's removing something to increase a behavior. So a negative reinforcement is going to be the removal of an unpleasant or aversive, is another term for that, stimulus to increase a behavior. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate something that is painful or annoying or something we don't like as a reward. Uh, a really nice example of this is like your um, seatbelt uh, light and sound in your car. Most of you probably have, if you have a car or your parents' car, and you get in and you don't buckle your seatbelt, um, you see that little flashy guy, and a lot of times it'll like make a really annoying beeping noise. That is negative reinforcement. So the idea is, is that you didn't buckle your seatbelt, so it's making this noise, and as soon as you buckle your seatbelt, what happens? The noise goes away. That's the negative reinforcement. You're being rewarded for doing what you're supposed to do, buckling your seatbelt, you're being rewarded for, rewarded for a behavior um, by taking away something that's annoying. This is the same thing if we're thinking about the Skinner box, that would be if we had a little bit of an electrical current in the floor and they push the lever and it stops. They're being rewarded by taking away something that was painful or annoying or something they don't like. Uh, negative reinforcement is also gonna cause what we call avoidance behavior. So avoidance behavior is basically where we will do something to prevent an aversive event um, by doing the, the behavior beforehand. So let's use our car example because I think it's the best one. Basically, when you get in your car, um, after, you know, let's say you, you got a new car and the noise it makes is super, super, super annoying when you don't buckle your seatbelt. Eventually what you do is you get in and you buckle your seatbelt before you turn on your car or before you go anywhere just because you know that noise is going to be annoying. That's avoidance behavior. We're doing something to stop the annoying thing before it happens. Now again, both of these are examples of reinforcement because we are, it's increasing the likelihood of us doing a behavior. So positive reinforcement, we're adding something that increases the likelihood of doing a behavior. 
negative reinforcement. We're taking something bad away to increase the chances we do a behavior. Um, our next piece is punishment. So on the other side of reinforcement, we have punishment. So punishment, uh, a punishing stimulus or punishment is a consequence that decreases the likelihood of a behavior occurring again. You can think of it the exact same as the, it's the opposite, I'm sorry, um, the opposite of reinforcement. So reinforces meant increases, punishment decreases. Now, one really important thing about punishment, we'll talk about this a little bit as well, is the timing of punishment is very, very, very important. It's important with reinforcement as well, but it's more important with punishment. You have to link punishment very quickly with the behavior. So when you punish someone or something, it needs to happen like immediately. As soon as a bad behavior happens, the punishment has to happen right away for it to be effective. If there's too much of a gap, um, the link won't be made. So like a, a simple example of this is like with your dog. If your dog does something, like maybe goes to the bathroom in your house and you are going to punish it somehow, you can't punish it an hour later because it has no idea what the punishment's for. You have to do it immediately right after. Otherwise, there won't be a link and it'll mess up what's going on. So we've got positive punishment and negative punishment, just like reinforcement. So positive punishment is uh, where we are going to add something unpleasant that's going to reduce a behavior. Okay, so again, positive is adding something. Punishment is something that will decrease a behavior. So it's two simple examples of positive punishments are like when you get yelled at by your mom or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your friend or whatever, or you get a ticket for speeding. We are adding something that is, that is uh, unpleasant, something that you don't like, and it's going to make you less likely to do it. If you do something and your mom yells at you and then you do it again and your mom yells at you again and again and again, Eventually, you're probably going to stop doing it just so you don't get yelled at. Okay? Our next example, I'm going to move myself really quick. All right. Um, our next example is a negative punishment. So, uh, again, a negative punishment, you can just think about it as the opposite, where our negative punishment is we are going to remove a pleasant stimulus to, again, decrease a behavior. So, positive, we're adding something in that we don't like. Negative, we're taking something away that we do like. So a simple example of a negative punishment is like timeout. Right, you can see that picture on the left there. It's timeout. So when you do something bad, when you're a little kid and you do something bad um, and you get in trouble, your parents put you in timeout, they're removing what you like. So you like being able to have freedom and do what you want and play with your toys or watch TV or whatever it is when you're a kid. They're removing that your ability to do that. Same thing, you know, as an adult, you guys probably either get grounded or your parents take your phone away, right? When you get in trouble, they take away your phone. They're removing something you like, in this case, your phone, that's going to decrease the chances you do that again. When you get in trouble, they take away your phone. You don't like that they take away your phone. So it makes you less likely to do whatever you did again later on. Move myself here. So here we are. We've got um, our kind of like nice little table. This is a pretty useful thing, I think, uh, for you. It's no new information. It's just a table way to think about it um, and kind of add things. So again, on one axis, we have positive, which is an added stimulus, negative, which is removing a stimulus. On the other, we've got reinforcement, which is increasing a behavior, punishment, which is decreasing a behavior. So a positive reinforcement is going to add something pleasant that causes an increase of the behavior. Positive punishment is going to add something negative or add something, I shouldn't say add something negative, is going to add something aversive, something we don't like, to reduce the behavior. Negative is going to remove something that we don't like, negative reinforcement, we're removing something we do not like to increase the behavior. Negative punishment, we're removing something we do like to decrease the behavior. Again, if you kind of just think about these main pieces, you should be able to put them together to figure out what you're talking about. So reinforcement increases behavior, punishment decreases behavior, positive is adding something, uh, negative is removing something. Adding stimulus, removing stimulus. Oops, sorry, we're gonna skip that. We're gonna watch that again later. Let me get out of the way here. 
Okay, so um, one of the things we have to talk about here, and we will talk more about this a little bit later in class as well, um, is punishment and parenting. Uh, this is a really big piece of psychology. A lot of behavioral psychology, especially um, you know in like the 60s, 70s, 80s, was really focused on parenting. That was a really important thing that we wanted to learn about, which is also why it's very uh, popular, why it's something that even if you're not a psychologist, you've probably heard about because this was a lot of the research they did. And a lot of the stuff we found was connecting punishment to uh, parenting and how and when and should we punish, basically. So here's some things that we know about uh, the connections between punishment and parenting. So one of them is that severe punishment uh, may actually cause the child to avoid the punisher instead of the behavior being punished. Now, this is really important, and this is all had to do with the timing piece as well, where basically if I'm a parent and I punish my child, but I'm like punishing them beyond maybe what is reasonable or maybe is realistic or fair based on what they did, instead of learning not to do that thing, what they might learn is to avoid me. So that what they're connecting the punishment to is the wrong response, basically. And, and we see this, right? This is something that we can track where we see that when we punish children too severely, it doesn't make them be better. It makes them not like the parent and it makes them avoid the parent. Uh, additionally, severe punishment may encourage things like lying um, to avoid a punishment. So again, right, if that punishment seems unfair um, or not, you know, proportional to what happened, instead of stopping doing whatever it is they're doing that's getting them in trouble, it might cause them to just lie about it instead. So instead of, you know, stopping the behavior, now I'm going to avoid or dislike the parent and I'm going to be more likely to lie because I'm trying to avoid punishment. We also know that severe punishment creates fear and anxiety, um, emotional responses that, again, do not promote learning. So when we are afraid or when we're anxious, it makes it really hard for us to learn. We don't learn well in those kind of environments. So, again, you can kind of see how all of these kind of pieces are actually having negative consequences. And this is, again, something we see where when we see punishment that's very severe, um, it actually ends up harming the kid and some in some ways making it worse. It doesn't stop them from doing the behavior. It stops them from, you know, learning. It stops them or it increases the likelihood they'll lie. It makes them resent or dislike the parent that's punishing them. And it has all these kind of negative consequences. Addition, uh, in addition, hitting, uh, for example, so physical punishment uh, actually provides what's called a successful model for aggression. Um, and this is kind of something we'll see a little bit later on as well. But the basic idea of it is if I punish my child by hitting them, by using physical punishment, basically I'm not teaching them don't do this thing. I'm teaching them that aggression is a okay way to, you know, carry out whatever I need to carry out. Um, so like one of the things we can track and see is that basically like if you are hit by your parent, you're more likely to hit your children. Um, and we see this in abuse as well. This is something we'll talk about later on. Um, but we know that like the majority of abusive parents were abused as children. So we see this model that kind of gets created where when we use these things, it not only harms that child, but it also makes them more likely to do the same thing to their children. So it's kind of this weird cycle that builds. Um, and again, we'll talk more about parenting when we talk about um, basically the growth cycle and, and, and uh, development of human beings. So we'll kind of get more into this a little bit later. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, okay, those were kind of some of the negative things or the things we could do wrong with punishment. What are some of the things that we can use to be effective? Because this isn't that, you know, we should never punish anybody or that should never be any consequences for doing anything, but how do we do it in a way that's, that's better? How do we do it in a way that's useful? So first thing is that punishment should follow, or I'm sorry, should immediately follow the behavior that's being punished. So if your kid does something, you, that punishment should happen immediately after. It shouldn't be, hey, my kid was acting up, and then three hours later when we get home, I yell at them. Again, they're not going to connect those two things. So the closer those two things happen at the same time, so if you do something and then you immediately get grounded, or they immediately take your phone away, or they immediately you know, do whatever they have to do, yell at you, 
it's going to be better. It's going to be more likely for us to tie what we did to the punishment as opposed to tying, you know, the parent to the punishment. Um, the next piece is that it should be consistent. So whatever that punishment is, it should be a consistent punishment. So I can't, you know, um, one day you do something and maybe you sneak out and I catch you and the first time I don't care, you know, I don't really do anything. And then the next time, you know, I hit you with my belt. That's not, that's not consistent. Um, so punishments need to be consistent. That way we know what the punishment is. We're connecting it. Again, you can kind of think of it in that way of classical conditioning where when something happens over and over and over and over and over again, we learn that those two things go together. So it has to be a consistent punishment. The next thing is punishment of the wrong behavior should be paired whenever possible with reinforcement of the right behavior. So this is a really big thing. We actually talk about this a lot in teaching um, and it's one of the things that we, we struggle with a lot of times as educators is we, you really shouldn't ever just punish as much as possible. You should punish and reward. So um, let's say, let's say we're uh, teaching now and I have a student that maybe talks out of turn all the time. They're always just like, they never raise their hand and they just blurt out answers. I'm sure you all have had a student like that before. Generally speaking, there's probably going to be some sort of punishment, right? Maybe I, um, take them out in the hall and have a talk with them. Maybe I send them to the office, right? There's some sort of punishment. And that's okay, like in a way that works, but it's a lot more effective if I also reinforce a good thing. So maybe uh, one day in class, that child raises their hand um, and answers a question, right? They wait their turn. I should reinforce or reward that student for that action. And what that's gonna do is now I'm doing both. So I'm not only punishing the thing they're doing wrong, but I'm rewarding the thing they're doing right. And eventually again, we're gonna push them towards doing whatever it is that we want them to do. Okay, so that's gonna get us to schedules of reinforcement. So, so far we've talked really just about like different kinds of reinforcements or punishments. Now we wanna talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about when and how they're applied. So schedules of reinforcement, uh, again, this is all coming from Skinner. He's very, very, very influential in this field. Um, is basically determining you know, how and when behavior will be followed by a reinforcer. So when will that reinforcer come? There's two different types. There is continuous and partial reinforcement. Now we'll break partial down into some more categories in just a little bit. Continuous is where every time a desired behavior happens, it's reinforced. So for example, um, if we think of the Skinner box and we think of that mouse, continuous reinforcement would be Every single time that that mouse hits that lever, they're getting a piece of food. Every single time. Every time they hit the lever, treat, lever, treat, lever, treat, over and over and over again. That's continuous. Partial is partial. It's where um, it's basically anything that's not continuous. So not reinforcing response every time. Slower acquisition, but greater resistance. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, again, the only difference is it's anything where it's not every single time. So every other, that would be partial. Every 50th, that would be partial. Every 10 minutes, that would be partial. So it's just basically breaking that up. Now, one thing we know, and I think, yeah, let's go back. Um, so one thing we know is that continuous reinforcement uh, has very quick acquisition. We talk, I think you remember we talked about acquisition, the acquisition phase in classical conditioning. It's how quickly right? It's when we are picking up the behavior, picking up the um, connection that we're talking about. So when we reward something every single time it happens, it causes people to very quickly start doing that behavior. So I'll give you an example. Maybe we're in class and I want kids to talk more. I want them to answer more questions. So what I do is every time you answer a question, you get a piece of candy. Well, as you can imagine, as soon as I start asking questions, a bunch of people are going to try and answer. And you're going to answer as many times as you can because every single time you get a piece of candy. That's continuous. Now, the problem with continuous is that the acquisition is very quick, but it's not very resistant to extinction. So just like with classical conditioning, operant conditioning can have that same extinction phase where over time we, we lose the connection. So again, if we're in this classroom and I give you guys a piece of candy every single time you raise your hand and answer a question, what happens if suddenly I just stop giving candy? Well, basically, everyone's going to stop answering questions because 
you don't, the only reason you were answering questions in the first place was to get the candy and now you're not getting candy anymore. So that extinction can be very quick. Partial reinforcement uh, is a slower acquisition, but it's more resistant to that extinction. So let's say um, instead of doing giving you a piece of candy every time you answered a question, let's say I did it randomly and you didn't know when I was. It's like a, you know, a random number. Okay. Um, what's going to happen is it's going to be slower for everyone to start answering questions, but when I stop giving candy, it's going to last longer. It's going to last longer. And the reason for that is that, again, when you don't know, you're, you're more likely to keep answering because you don't know, okay, am I going to get a candy next or not? You never know when it's going to happen. So it, it's more uh, resistant to that extinction. So we're going to look at that here. So um, we can, again, break these partial, these types of partial reinforcement up. So there's four different types of partial reinforcement. We have fixed ratio, variable ratio, fixed interval, and variable interval. And again, we can break these down. We'll break down fixed versus variable and ratio versus interval. And then we're going to look at this graph every single time as well. So a fixed ratio is a schedule of reinforced, uh, schedules reinforced behavior after a set number of responses. Once conditioned, the animal will pause only briefly after a reinforcer and will then return to a high rate of responding. So fixed ratio, let's pretend uh, we're that mouse in the Skinner box. Every fourth time that we push the lever, we get a piece of food, we get a treat. What we're going to do is we're going to push the lever a bunch of times until we get a treat. We're going to stop, we're going to eat our treat, and then we're immediately going to start pushing the lever again. We're going to get those four times, treat, and we're going to go back to it. So you can see that in this first graph right here, right? There's going to be a whole bunch of responses very quickly. So this is how many times they push that lever. These little lines here represent the reinforcers. So this is every treat. Okay, so you can see we're, um, what's the word? Uh, we are doing, carrying out our behavior, right? We're responding. We're doing that lever push very, very quickly. Okay, now we can uh, compare this to what's called a variable ratio. So a variable ratio is still a ratio, so it's, um, but now it's going to be changing. So provide reinforcers after an unpredictable number of responses. So before, right, let's say, I mean, I think this is what, every 150 it looks like about? Yeah. Every 150 le pushes is when they got a treat before. Now it's random, right? You can see how it's changing each time. So that's a variable ratio. Now, just like a fixed ratio, that's going to produce a really high rate of response. Um, again, the, the mouse is learned or is learning that the, they are actually getting the treat by pushing the lever. So they know the more they push the lever, the more treats they're going to get and the quicker those treats are going to come. Now, the difference is, is that um, with a variable ratio, we're actually going to see more connections to kind of like a, almost like kind of an addictive model. So uh, an example that actually works really well for a variable ratio is a slot machine. Um, slot machines work on variable ratios. So if you think about every time you put your money in and you pull the lever, it's random when you're going to win, right? Sometimes you win a little bit, sometimes you win a lot, but it's totally random. You never know when that next hit is going to be. You never know that next time you're going to win. And that's what makes them actually very, very addicting is, you know, maybe you start out and you're like, oh, I'm just going to do a little bit. And you play and maybe you win one or two, you know, um, but you, when you run out, there's always that thought of, you know, the next one could be the one that wins because you never know. And that's kind of where we see like things like gambling addiction um, come in is part of it is because of that variable ratio. This is also um, something that's becoming very, very common in like video games. Um, if you've ever... I mean, I'm sure all of you have at this point, because all of you, I'm sure, at least play a game on your phone or something, um, but like something like a loot box or any sort of random reward where it like, you know, it actually a lot of times looks like a slot machine where it spins around and then like you get these prizes or whatever, that's variable ratio. You're getting a random reward or you don't know when you're going to get a reward, but it makes you want to play more. It makes you want to do whatever that behavior is more. So you can see, again, with both of these, 
we're going to have really high rates of response. Generally speaking, variable ratio is going to last longer, be more um, addicting than a fixed ratio. Now we can again uh, compare these to interval schedules. So our first interval schedule is what's called fixed. Again, fixed means it's going to stay the same. So a fixed interval schedule is going to reinforce the first response after a fixed period of time. So interval is referring to time. Ratio is for referring to the amount of behaviors. And fixed is, or I'm sorry, an interval is referring to a time period. So a fixed time period means that time period is going to stay the same every single time. So what we're going to see is what they call like this kind of like choppy um, stop start pattern of behavior as opposed to this like really steady rate of high responses. So basically in this one, it looks like, what is it? Every 20 minutes ish. Is that kind of what that is? Yeah, somewhere in there, it's like 25 to 40. So somewhere in there, I can't tell how far these are apart, to be honest. Um, let's just say like, let's say like 15, 20 minutes, right? So every 20 minutes, for example, um, you this mouse is able to get a reward. Now what's going to happen is eventually that they learn that this is when they can get a reward. So what we'll see is basically no responses. And then as they get close to that time limit, we're going to see a whole bunch of responses and then no responses, and then a whole bunch of responses as they get close. Again, it doesn't matter how many times they hit the lever or they carry out the behavior. It's all about the time. So we're not going to see anything until all of a sudden that response is going to be rewarded soon, and then we're going to see a whole bunch of work. Right? So we see this choppy starting and stopping. Uh, an example that maybe would connect more with you, where we see fixed interval a lot, is if any of you have a class where you have a weekly test or a, a test every other week, that's where we see fixed interval. So for example, let's say you have a class, let's say you have a math class on Thursday, and you know every Thursday you're going to have a quiz. How do you guys study? I guarantee that the majority of you don't do any studying until Wednesday or Wednesday night, then you study really hard for maybe even a few hours. You study really, really hard Wednesday. You take the test Thursday, and then you don't study again until next Wednesday. That's this right here. The behavior is the studying. The reward you're getting is ideally the, the good grade on the test. But what you're going to do is because you know exactly when that test is going to happen, you're not going to carry out the behavior until you know that test is going to go. So you don't do anything, and then you study really hard, and then you stop, right? So you study really hard, take the test, you stop for a while. Wednesday night comes back up, you study really hard, stop, and again and again and again. Now we can compare this to a variable interval schedule, which you can probably guess how that works. Um, it's still going to be interval, so it's still based on time, but now that time frame is always going to change. It's going to be varying. So you don't really know when it's going to happen. So variable interval schedules tend to produce what are what we call like slow, steady responses. Slow, steady responses. Now the reason this works is because you don't really have any idea when the behavior is going to happen, right? How much you do the behavior doesn't make a difference, um, but you also don't know when it's gonna when you're going to be rewarded. So you have to constantly be carrying out the behavior. So in our first ones, our mites are pressing our levers in our ratios really quickly because basically when they get to a certain point they get that reward um, another way you could connect this maybe to your life is if you have something like an apex class if you've ever taken those um, an apex class basically the faster you do the work the faster you get done so you could finish a whole apex class in a few days if you are really good at it so it encourages you know this kind of fixed ratio where i know if i just sprint through the content i'm going to get the rewards really quickly and get done really quickly which is probably the biggest reward where um, with our variable interval, now we're talking about time. So we can again connect this to a class. Now, in let's say you're still in that math class, but now instead of saying, hey, you're gonna have a quiz every Thursday, they say you're gonna have a quiz every week, but you don't know what day it is. Let's pretend we have class every single day. So you don't know if the test is gonna be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And it can, be, it can be whenever. So what you're going to do is you're not going to kind of go as crazy. You're not going to like study for 13 hours like maybe you would in an Apex class just to try and get it done really fast. 
but you're going to study a little bit every single day because if the test is on Monday, well, hopefully you studied on Sunday, otherwise you wouldn't be ready. But maybe it's not on Monday, so you're not going to go super crazy, but you're going to do a little bit. And then maybe the test isn't Monday. Well, I still need to study a little bit because the test could be on Tuesday. Then it's not on Tuesday. Okay, well, it might be on Thursday. You know, so you're gonna you're always going to be doing a little bit. This one is really big. Actually, variable interval is really big because this kind of slow, steady um, response or for us, like trying to learn something, this is one of the best ways to do it is to basically go through these slow, steady learning curves. This way right here is actually one of the worst ways. And we'll talk about like why this doesn't work very well. Um, even though, unfortunately, this is kind of how most of us study. Most of you probably work on stuff, maybe even for this class, but you probably don't study super hard until the day before the test. And then you study really, really hard. And then you stop for a while again. This is how most of us do it. This is probably the best way. So again, we have this nice little chart. This is just, again, comparing them. As long as you can remember what fixed versus variable is and ratio versus interval is, you should be able to combine these and put them together. So again, fixed is the number or of the, beha the uh, behavior or the time in between the intervals is the same. It's constant. Fixed is constant. Uh, variable means it's variable. It changes. Ratio is, means it's based on the behavior. So how many times does the behavior happen? Interval is based on time. So a fixed ratio is a um, constant number of the behavior. So every time you do a behavior a certain amount of times, you get a reward. Fixed interval is every time period. So every however much time is going to be, you're going to get a reward. It's going to be constant again. Variable ratio means that it's still about how many times you push the bar or how many times you do the behavior, but it's random. You don't know how many times before your next reward. Variable interval is time, right? Uh, you don't know when the next reward will come, but doing the behavior more doesn't speed it up. Okay, that is going to wrap up our conversation for today about operant conditioning and then obviously those schedules of reinforcement. Take a few moments and please do a uh, quick summary uh, and I'll see you guys next time.